Welcome to the Untold Tales Audio Anthologies. Written by Dr. Jeffrey A. Robinson and narrated by Melissa Del Toro Schaffner. Alternities Pavel Morgan hunched over the desk in his off-campus apartment, tinkering with his new invention. This could change everything for me, he thought, especially if my thesis paper gets published. Since he was so short and thin, even at 21, he was often mistaken for a visiting high school student and frequently drew stares from the other students here at MIT. He blamed his diminutive height on his father, who was Welsh, though his mother, a Pakistani from Kashmir, was also small. With his dark curly hair, he looked more like his dad, but he had inherited his mom's quick, sharp, dark eyes. Pausing, he reflected on how this demonstration of his new theory could change his life. Maybe it would even help him fit in here. Pavel had grown up in London and had come to America to study at MIT. Everyone considered him to be something of a prodigy. His father called him a savant, but Pavel hated that word. It made him even more of an outsider and an oddball than he already was. Although he could have graduated from high school at 15, his parents held him back. Because he had always been shy and quite small for his age, his parents had worried that he would grow more socially if he was kept with others of his own age. They should have let me go, he thought. Pavel had never fit in. He had always been a loner in elementary school and high school, and he had never had any real friends. Everyone considered him to be the little nerd, and he had spent his youth either being bullied or ignored. Part of the problem was that no one ever understood what he talked about. His classmates couldn't follow his conversations, and he found them all boring and dull. However, since starting college, he had blossomed and had been allowed to accelerate his studies. After only three years out of high school, he had plans to graduate with his master's at the end of the current year. Yet even here in college, he remained a misfit. To begin with, after he'd arrived, he found he couldn't choose a major. It wasn't that he wasn't interested in any particular subject. The problem was that he was interested in too many. His first love, of course, was physics, though he had always had a passion for much and loved solving problems. His fondness for brain teasers and puzzles caused him to spend an inordinate amount of time wasting his time on games. His second choice for a major would have been engineering, since he loved practical applications of science rather than pure theory. His professors, however, criticized him for not choosing a specialization and for taking too many useless electives like philosophy and psychology. His problem was that he was a true polymath. He was interested in everything. His brain was always in hyperdrive, and he imagined things and thought of things faster than he could explain to others. His isolation here at MIT continued and was, in part, self-inflicted. For instance, he had read about how Isaac Asimov had breezed through college. Therefore, at the beginning of each semester, Pavel imitated his hero and skipped all the frat parties on campus and sequestered himself in his room, reading all of his assigned texts cover to cover. He loved games, but only those you played alone or with few others. To him, the most popular online MMO RPGs were adolescent, and he hated them almost as much as he had hated high school. But even his private passion for games set him at odds at the university. To make things more fun, he turned his exams into games. Racing to see how fast he could finish, he was always the first one out of the class and the only one with a perfect grade. As a result, his fellow students shunned him because they thought him odd. They didn't understand him, and frankly, his raw intelligence intimidated them. Even his professors thought him strange and endlessly distracted because he was impatient and wouldn't listen to their lectures and explanations. They assumed he didn't understand when he really did. It was just that he had already moved on to ask the next set of questions that no one else in the class would ever get to. 
It was okay, though. He had grown used to it. As he tightened the last electrical connection, he tore off the jeweler's loop he was wearing and carefully set his prototype down. He was done. Now, all he had to do was implant the seed of the Bose einstein condensate he had snuck out of the cryogenics lab. He had it in a specifically insulated vial that contained 5 milligrams of sodium, supercooled to 170 nanokelvins, and stabilized in a laser-resonant matrix. If the university found he had taken it, he would get in trouble. But he was confident that he wouldn't get expelled or anything, not with his GPA. After inserting the tiny seed into his device, he stood back and studied his handiwork. The device looked more like a Rube Goldberg machine than a serious engineering application. It consisted of a metal cylinder about 18 inches long with a small rectangular box of electronics soldered to its side. The BEC seed rested in a chamber in the center of the cylinder. Thin wisps of mist swirled around it from the small reservoir of liquid nitrogen that helped it keep cool. All this rested on a large square lithium ion battery and with the unusual optics and lenses at each end of it, the device looked like a giant child's kaleidoscope sitting on top of a shiny car battery. Holding his breath, he turned it on and started playing with it. His eyes grew wide with wonder as he realized that it worked, and as he started playing with it to determine its capabilities, time stopped for Pavel. Hours passed, and he didn't notice it at all at least until he was finally disturbed by a loud banging on his door. Four men burst into his apartment. Two were armed. An older man in a suit held a clipboard with some papers, and the fourth held a device that looked like an electronic tablet, except that it was thick, like a heavy book or dictionary. Pavel Morgan, said the man in the suit, as the rest of his team searched the apartment. Pavel carefully set his device down, not wanting to make any sudden movement, since the two armed men seemed a bit nervous. Yes, he replied. You need to come with us, said the man in charge. Turning to address the others, he added, Is there anyone else in here? No, replied the other man. The room is clear. He's alone. Addressing the man with the tablet, the man in charge asked, Do you have anything? Studying the display on the piece of equipment he held, the last man replied, No. I scanned the past two days, and he's been here alone with no visitors of any kind, so there's no one else involved. He's been working on his device for more than 48 hours without interruption. The man stopped and studied Pavel. Is that right? He asked. You created this all by yourself. Pavel nodded. Does anyone else know of this device? I would have said no, he replied, but you seem to know about it, so I can't be certain who else might be aware of it. The man grinned and then grew serious. Aren't you going to protest or ask who we are or what we're doing here? Aren't you even going to resist coming with us? Pavel shook his head. I figure it wouldn't do any good, and that you'll tell me what you want me to know in good time. The man blinked in surprise and then shrugged. Good. You're being reasonable. Just don't cause me any trouble and you won't get harmed. With smooth practice motions, they cuffed him, put a hood on him, and escorted him away. About a half hour later, Pavel's hood was removed and he found himself sitting in a chair in the middle of a large room. Moments later, someone took off his wrist restraints and Pavel rubbed his hands as he studied the men before him. Two guards stood slightly behind him, dressed in black tactical military outfits. Five others stood in front of him. The first was the man who had abducted him and the technician with the electronic tablet who had accompanied the team. Another man wore a white lab coat, and the two remaining men were older and wore expensive business suits. One of the suited men asked the team leader, Did he give you any trouble? No, he's been quite cooperative. Good. I assume you were able to get everything? Yes, said the team leader. We confiscated the device, all of his notes and journals, and other equipment we weren't sure about. Nodding slightly, the old man in charge turned to Pavel. You are Pavel Morgan, he asked. Yes, Pavel replied. Do you understand why we're here? I assume that it's because of my invention. That's right. And this is something you created? Yes. Did anyone else help you? Does anyone else know about this device you've created? 
No. No one else knows what I've been doing. Not even my professors. The only person who might know about it is my publisher. I sent a copy of my thesis to him to see if it could get published. Pavel paused and tilted his head. I assume that's how you learned of it, and that's the reason you've abducted me and confiscated my invention. Smiling, the man said, <laughs> That's correct. You're pretty smart. Do you have any idea what you've discovered and how important it is? Yes, of course, replied Pavel. It's a quantum phase optical filter that translates temporally shifted virtual photons into visual images. The leader turned to the man in the lab coat, who nodded and said, That's one way of describing it. We've come to call it a temporal viewer, but his description is technically more accurate. Facing Pavel, the man said, So you know what it does, and you understand how it might be used. Yes, of course. I've been testing its capabilities since I activated it, and I'm pretty sure I know what it could be used for, but why don't you tell me what you think it can do? Oh, we know. We've been using it secretly for more than eight years now. Your device is a crude version of our technology, but it appears to work. Gesturing at the technician's thick black tablet, he added, You see, we've managed to miniaturize it over the past few years, but like your device, it lets us look back through time, and it's a technology that we simply cannot allow anyone else to learn about. And that's why you've decided to seize me and my invention? Yes. You see, a device that can look back through time is a very powerful tool. While it could be used for great benefit, like solving crimes or finding missing persons, it also represents a critical threat to national security. For instance, if you could get to the proper location, you could peek over the shoulder of someone who had been there a week earlier and see all the passwords that they had typed on their computer. Or if someone discovered any abandoned CIA safe house, they could look backwards in time and identify everyone who had been there. With this device, there are essentially no secrets anymore and we simply cannot allow it to fall into the wrong hands. Pavel nodded. Yes, it would be the perfect spy and surveillance device. The way you're using it would be like a CCT security cameras that covered every location at any time. This is all too predictable, he thought, and I'm pretty certain that they don't really understand what I've built. Precisely. But you aren't curious about what we're going to do? Well, it's pretty obvious you'll seize my invention, suppress the publication of my thesis, and make me an offer to work with you or face dire consequences. Something like that, said the man. I am Andrew Boratan, and am the director of Exegis Intelligence, though we simply call it the Bureau. In any case, I do have an offer for you, but you've already guessed that, haven't you? I guess that means you have no objection to working for us. I really don't see that I have an option, said Pavel. I assume you have papers you want me to sign? Boratan looked a bit surprised, but he finally nodded to one of his colleagues, who brought a series of papers to Pavel to sign. As he signed the agreement, the man said, Don't you have any questions? You seem to be taking this quite well. Actually, said Pavel, returning the signed papers and pen to the nearby aide, I have a question for that man. Pavel pointed to the man who had spoken earlier. I assume you're the one in charge of this technology. You seemed quite knowledgeable about it. The man nodded and said, Yes, I'm Dr. Langrider, and I'm the head of the technology branch here at the Bureau. What was it you wanted to know? Pavel's face grew serious, and he said, I was wondering why you only use this technology to look backward in time. Why don't you use it to look forward in time as well? The doctor smiled and said, Ah, that's because you can only look backward in time. You can't look into the future. Tilting his head, Pavel said, I assume you've based your work on Fleischmann's time-dependent wave equations that describe the behavior of virtual particles from Richard Feynman's theories. So why can't you resolve images of virtual particles from the future? The doctor nodded condescendingly and replied, Because when the time delay is positive, that is the time delay from a past moment to the present. Those equations result in a single real solution. However, when the delta t is negative, you end up taking the square root of a negative number, and there are an infinite number of imaginary solutions. 
You cannot look forward in time. In practical terms, you would need a quantum lens with a negative focal length, and then you would only see an infinite number of possible solutions. Pavel shook his head, saying, But you can. You can use a magnetic field to change the convex shape of the condensate lens to make it concave. That provides the negative focal length you need. Then you can adjust the aperture to resolve individual solutions. The infinite solutions you find are all different possible futures. The doctor frowned as he considered what Pavel had said. Prompting him further, Pavel added, Go ahead, use my device. I already made those modifications. If you follow the instructions in my notes, you can use them to see alternate future timelines. After a moment's hesitation, the doctor hurried to Pavel's device and opened his journals to reference them. In a matter of moments, the doctor had taken the temporal viewer to the window and was scanning possible futures. The video display on the device showed the Boston skyline in the distance. Referencing different settings that Pavel had recorded in his notes, the doctor saw different futures. In some, weather was sunny. In others, it was raining. Go ahead, suggested Pavel. Look out further in the future and try some of those lower probability settings that I recorded. Dr. Langreter did so, and in one image, the Boston skyline was now dominated by three super-large skyscrapers, each more than a mile high. That's just one possible future, said Pavel. That's something that could happen, but I can't imagine the number of decisions and choices that would need to occur to build something like that. But don't stop there. Try some of the other settings. In rapid succession, different scenes of Boston appeared on the viewer. In one, the city was clean and pristine, without the slightest hint of smog. In another, the city had been abandoned, flooded by rising ocean water. In a third alternate future, Boston was a wasteland, a ruinous landscape of destroyed buildings. Quickly interjecting, Pavel said, Yes, that's an interesting one. It's a view from a very low probability timeline, an alternate future about 40 years from now. I don't know what might have caused the devastation. It could have been a natural disaster or war or even a plague. It would take a considerable amount of time to examine the timeline to determine the cause. In any case, as you can see, my version of the device can not only see backward in time, but forward to possible futures as well. The doctor was almost speechless. This, this, this is amazing. This could change everything. We could use this to see what might happen. We could see possible terrorist attacks before they occur and head them off, or we could see natural disasters and prepare for them. The man in charge turned to his colleagues. If you're right, he said, this could prove to be more important than what we have now. We could use this new capability to focus on specific futures that we'd like to occur, and then make specific decisions to make them happen. Of course, we'd need to completely reorganize. Wait, said the doctor, something's wrong. He stared at the screen on Pavel's viewer that he held in his hands. However, instead of looking out the window, he had turned away from the window and was now facing the center of the room. What is it? said the director. Here, look. I was turning off the device when I focused it on this room. This is a scene of the future just a short while from now. Glancing at the image on the display, Bora Tan saw them all standing in the room, but they were surrounded by others who had weapons pointed at them. Who are those guys? he demanded. I have no idea said the doctor. When is this? Just a few minutes from now. What's happening? It looks like everybody's arguing. Well, no one's supposed to have access to this floor except us. Someone, go outside and check the hallway. Find out what's going on out there. The security guards in the room drew their weapons and hurried out of the room. No sooner had they stepped outside than there was a muffled buzzing sound followed by distinct thuds of people falling to the floor. Everyone in the room looked at one another, uncertain about what was happening. It was then that five people walked in. Three of them held unusual-looking weapons. Where are the guards? demanded Boratan. A tall man in a black suit and dark-rimmed glasses stepped forward and spoke. Don't worry about them. They've been dealt with. Who are you? shouted the director. 
And what do you think you're doing? Nah, <laughs> well, my organization has many names, but that doesn't matter right now. All you need to know is that you and your enterprise have just been shut down. What? stammered Dr. Boratan. What do you mean? You can't just barge in here and... <laughs> Actually, we can, interrupted the man in black. In accordance with the National Security Directives, your organization has been officially disbanded. Your funds have been seized. Even as we speak, your staff is being taken to a special facility where they'll be debriefed. They'll be instructed that everything associated with this operation has been classified, and that talking to anyone about it will result in their immediate incarceration, without normal due process. You can't do this! The man in charge waved his hand dismissively and said, It's already done. By what authority? began Boratan. The intruder reached into a folder he was carrying and withdrew a sheaf of papers. It's all there, he said. We've been authorized by a secret Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, but even they don't know the full details of this operation. Officially, your company, Exegis, no longer even exists. Boratan bristled with anger as he reached into his coat pocket and took out his phone. I'm going to call Senator Stuart Coleman. He's on our steering committee. You can't do this. The stranger smiled softly and folded his hands in front of him. <laughs> Go ahead, he said. But the senator has already been instructed not to answer your calls. Boratan hurriedly placed his call, but was directed to voicemail. He tried unsuccessfully to reach the senator two more times before he hung up and said, Damn! An aide reached out and carefully took the phone. As I was explaining, your operations have been terminated. Fortunately, you have compartmentalized your organization in such a way that only a small handful of people actually understand how your technology works. Turning to the scientist, the stranger said, Dr. Langreder, you'll have to come with us. Your six colleagues downstairs are already in custody. All of your equipment has been confiscated and all your records secured. Without saying a word, Dr. Langreder allowed himself to be escorted out of the room. You can't do this, repeated Boratan angrily. It's not legal. <laughs> Actually, it is. Reaching into his folder once more, the man in black pulled out a single sheet of paper and handed it to Dr. Boratan. Here's a note from your lawyers that was drafted less than an hour ago. It summarizes orders from a secret federal court that you don't have clearance to know about. Go ahead, read it. As Boratan studied the document, the man turned to Pavel, who had been patiently watching the drama. So, don't you have anything to say? Pavel grinned and said, I was wondering when you'd arrive. Boratan looked up and muttered, What do you mean? You knew about this? Turning to the former director, Pavel explained, No, but I was expecting this. I mean, Dr. Boratan, you've been a bit myopic. You discovered this new technology and used it to peer into the past, but you never fully realized what you had. I rediscovered it and taught you something new, how to see possible futures. However, I realized that if I'd discovered your secret, then others might have as well. But I also realized that if someone had discovered it, it might well have been discovered before either of us. Also, I figured that if that were true, then they'd eventually show up and, well, here they are. Boratan was speechless. At that point, an aide came up to the dark stranger and whispered, Professor, all the new personnel have now been transported off-site where their debriefing will be finished. All assets, computers, hard drives, and physical devices have also been secured. Pavel's eyebrows rose as the man in charge returned his attention to the others. He whispered, Professor? It's an old honorific. I no longer teach, he said dismissively. In any case, you need to come with me. Why me? I'm not involved with these others. Oh, that's not the reason. You need to come with us because you're quite special. You see things that others do not, that others cannot. It is a talent that would be wasted out there in the normal world. Also, we've been watching you for some time now and waiting for this moment to finally meet. I'm not sure I fully understand, said Pavel. Ah, uh, I seriously doubt that. 
As you surmised, we've possessed the ability to see the multitude of futures, like those you've glimpsed, for a very long time. And we've also learned how to select which of those many possible futures will become reality. In fact, we've foreseen this moment and prepared for it for many years. There's much that you can only learn if you join us. Turning to the director, he said, I should thank you for your work on refining this technology. It will greatly improve our work, especially since we've been utilizing other methods for a very long time. This isn't over, said Boratan, as he and his companion surged toward the doorway. The guards started to block them, but the professor simply said, let them go. Together with his colleagues, Director Boratan stormed out of the conference room and found the hallway empty, except for two guards that lay unconscious on the floor. Hurrying downstairs, they discovered that all the other rooms in the building were also empty. Everyone was gone. Heading down the elevator, they whispered to one another about what they were going to do. But upon exiting the elevator and reaching the parking lot, they were surprised to find a helicopter waiting for them, where they expected their limos to be. More darkly dressed men approached and directed the executives into the helicopter. The former Exegis directors complied without any resistance. Nothing was said, as they were cuffed and assisted into the aircraft. As the Professor and Pavel arrived at the building's exit, the helicopter took off and disappeared into the darkening twilight sky. The man gestured for Pavel to go to a second nearby vehicle. Pavel found the car somewhat unusual. It was one of those very symmetrical designs that made it difficult to tell from a distance which end was the front and which was the back. The windows were heavily tinted, so he couldn't tell where the driver might sit. As they approached the car, a gullwing door opened, revealing two sets of seats that faced one another. As they climbed into the car, the man said to Pavel, We've been watching you for some time. You have a fascinating past, but I assure you, your future is going to be far more amazing than you could possibly imagine. Together, they climbed in, taking seats facing one another. It was then that Pavel realized that he saw no controls or steering wheel inside the car. Neither was there a driver. As he wondered about these matters, the door closed silently and the vehicle rose slowly into the air. Then, with a flash of light, it was gone. Thank you for listening. Can you believe we're moving into season four of the Untold Tales podcast? I literally can't even believe it. We are so grateful, and you know we love our listeners, fans, and patrons. We are excited to announce that in January 2023, we are going to be relaunching this podcast with new initiatives in YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, as well as a new website. And we are hoping that you would be willing to help us on our launch team. So if you're interested in joining our launch team, please email us at untoldtalespodcast at gmail.com or you can message us on any of our socials. We'd love to serve more people like you. So please share this podcast with your friends and family and anybody who might be a sci-fi buff. I know that they'll love it. And we hope that you love what you hear. Have a great holiday season and happy new year.